And see, that's what it is. We're, we're looking at, the, we've talked about that in here, and you know, the whole, if you remember, the energy paradox is the idea that this event, the melting, was accompanied by an injection of energy into the terrestrial system that had no really known source. Because there was no terrestrial energy, no source of terrestrial energy capable of, of achieving that kind of, 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 of effect. And so the energy paradox was first discovered in the early 70s when they began to think that the ice disappeared in 10,000 years and not 30 or 40,000 years. And when they thought that the ice could disappear in 30 to 40,000 years, there's, a, you, there's enough energy available. We had a little ice age that we were in for 400 years. During that little ice age, from about 1350 to 18, about 1400 to 1800 or 1850, depends on where you look, but there was a period of global cooling. It caused glaciers to expand worldwide, and in fact, to some uh, glaciologists that have looked at it, they think it was the biggest expansion of glaciers since the Big Ice Age uh, of, that ended 10 to 12,000 years ago. When the Little Ice Age glaciers begin to recede between 1850 and, and 1950, what we saw was that they receded without necessarily causing catastrophic flooding. That's the key of the whole thing. They essentially, you could go and watch them recede several feet a year, as they've been doing consistently now from about the mid-1800s down to the present. When you see somebody coming up and, and, and talking about, oh, the glaciers have shrunk, and they show you a picture, say, of the glaciers in 1960 or 1970, and then a glacier, the same glacier now, just remember that that process of contraction actually started over 150 years ago. And it was starting from the largest, the glaciers had grown globally since the Big Ice Age. So it's somewhat disingenuous to say, you know, that to, to just then conclude from that, that the only or exclusive effect causing glaciers to recede is, is human influence. Because in 1850 to 1940, it's acknowledged that there was no significant increase in CO2 caused by human activities. But the glaciers did most of their recession between those years. What we see now has been an ongoing process since the middle 19th century. And again, it started out from glaciers being the largest they had been in, in nearly 10,000 years. So, but what I'm getting at is with that contraction of the glaciers, a lot of streams were carrying lots of, you know, they were, they were augmented with a lot of meltwater. So a lot of streams were carrying more discharge than they would have been carrying while the glaciers were expanding, say from 13 to 14 to 1500 years ago. They were also carrying a lot more sediment. When the glaciers pulled back, they created a whole suite of landforms, such as moraines and erratic boulders and stuff, that allowed the natural philosophers of the 16 and 1700s and 1800s, early 1800s, to witness firsthand the effects of first glaciers growing, how they modify the landscape through their growth, and then contracting, and how they in turn modify the landscape as they contract. Once they saw that process happening real time in front of their eyes, they saw the building of moraines. They saw the formation of eskers or sinuous uh, mounds of material that were actually flowing through the in tunnels through the glaciers. When they saw the large boulders left behind, what that did was it allowed them, it gave them the eyes to then see. By, let me put it this way, by recognizing the effects of the Little Ice Age, it gave them the eyes to see the effects of the Big Ice Age. Coming down off the Alps, there are, there are valleys that go to the northwest towards the Jura Mountains, which are about 30 miles away. The Jura Mountains are to the Alps, much as the Appalachian Mountains are to the Rocky Mountains. They're much lower, they're, they're, they're much more eroded down, so they're not the sharp, young, orogenic features like you see in the Rocky Mountains. During the Big Ice Age, all the glaciers over the Alps grew down, completely filled this 30-mile valley between the Alps and the Jura Mountains with ice. And it carried granitic rocks whose source was from the Alps, carried these boulders over and dropped them in the Jura Mountains, which I believe were a type of uh, sedimentary, ancient sedimentary carboniferous rocks. They were very distinct. 
in any case, the granites came from the, the Alps, I think it was, or maybe it was vice versa. And anyways, the erratics were very distinct rocks. So people had noticed these and had attributed those to the effects of Noah's flood. Okay, so now the Little Ice Age comes along. The ice expands down from the Alps. It does in miniature the same thing the big ice does, only instead of carrying the erratics all the way across this 30-mile valley separating the two mountain ranges, it brings the erratics down to the foothills of the Alps, maybe five miles from the base, and, and dumps them there. So now they look and they see the erratics, and they see the moraine, the jumbled rock, piles of rock and debris that's shoveled up in front of the glacier as it advances. Imagine a bulldozer just pushing up a pile of stuff, it stops, and then it just goes into reverse, and it leaves this pile that you can look at and go, okay, this is how far the bulldozer came. That's essentially what a glacier does, and it leaves this arcuate form of this till, it's called, or in the old days, drift, when it was still believed to have been emplaced by Noah's flood, this jumbled stuff, and it marks the limits of the glacier. And then associated with that will be these large erratic boulders that were quarried by the ice. And beyond it then will be this outwash plain composed of this fine sedimentary material like you see right here. So all of these features that the big ice age created were recreated in miniature by the little ice age. So they were able to go out and see firsthand these features of the little ice age and then finally figure out that, hey, these granite boulders here on the Jura Mountains are exactly like these rocks over in the Alps. And look, here's this jumbled stuff that contains material from the Alps. And they soon figured out that the ice had once been many, many, literally thousands of times greater. The glaciers of the Alps had been thousands of times more massive. And that was how they came to understand the Big Ice Age. So, what they did was they used the present as the key to the past, and hence was born the concept of uniformitarianism by looking at the present, trying to decipher events that happened in the past. And it became a very, very powerful tool for understanding past processes that were essentially no longer operational. The problem came in when uniformitarianism became a dogma. And anybody who then proposed that, well, wait a second, things sometimes have happened that weren't at the modern rates. Modern rates were always, were, we've been told, are slow. One drop of water, geology changes one drop of water or one grain of sand at a time. And this is what we were talking. Anybody who went to school in the post-World War II era, from the 50s up to probably even the 80s, was taught that. You know, in science class, when we had our two-week section on Earth history, we would see a film or read in our textbook about how geological change happens over many millions and millions of years. And, and if we got into it a little bit further, we were taught about the concept of uniformity and how geologists would study things going on today and then extrapolate to things going on in the past. Well, it turns out that the concept of uniformity works the other way, too. It not only tells us about things... Uh, modern correlation to things that happened in the past, it tells us when things happened in the past that have no modern correlations, no modern historical analogs by which we can say, yeah, here is this thing happening and it's the same as this thing that happened a million years ago or a hundred thousand years ago or a hundred million years ago. Certainly there are catastrophes in the history of the earth and I tell, you know, if somebody asks me, you know, my, my philosophical point of view, I say I'm a catastrophist. I believe there's two modes of change. There's the type of change that we generally go through day to day in, in most of our lives, but even using uh, a single human life as being an analog analogy to a greater cycle, you know, everybody sometime in their life you have a catastrophe. You know, you fall off a ladder. You go through, you know, day after day and nothing much happens. And then one day you fall off a ladder. That becomes a catastrophe. And what happens during those few moments, you're in a car wreck. You know, whatever. You can come up with a, a thousand different things that could happen. But, what, but the key, the, 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 the idea is that within that limited small amount of time, more change happens. In effect, I mean, if you fall off a ladder and break two legs, you know, you, what happens during that period of time affects your life as much as, you know, several years of life, normal life, put together or more. And it's the same way when you're talking about the life of a planet or the life of a world. It's the catastrophes that basically set the whole direction of evolutionary change. 
and catastrophe is, is now becoming finally recognized by modern thinkers as it was by ancient thinkers as being the dominant process. You know, just like they say in war, warfare, you know, it's long periods of, of boredom separated by short periods of terror. Well, that's the catastrophic model of Earth history. And even though we may like to think that, you know, it's a long, slow, pleasant ride with may, maybe a regional or a local event here and there to upset the, 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 the order of things and the placid pace of change, the reality is that there are periods of concentrated change where within a matter of a very short period of time, there's many times more change than there is in these long intervals of quiet in between. And that's essentially a catastrophic model. And once you begin to think in terms of a catastrophic model, the catastrophes have left their fingerprints all over our planet. Going back to the, we certainly see them going back to the very beginnings of life and beyond. The, the early, the, the bombardment period that, that culminated the formation of our planet was violent beyond really anything we could even begin to imagine. Um, the birth of the moon must have been incredibly traumatic. That's a subject we definitely need to come back to also, the moon, because it's ve very important, and I will have a program I'm going to do on the moon. But, um, but coming right down, we see that the history of life has been a history of great catastrophes, where life is going along smoothly and then something interrupts it, and there's a whole other level of stuff that happens. Well, 12,000 years ago, something, something, and we can only presume, I only presume, we have to look outside the system to find the source. There was an event that basically precipitated the end of the Ice Age. And all the scientists that have looked at it, the climate scientists who have studied it from this angle would agree that once an Ice Age is in place, it almost should be completely self-perpetuating. And why would that be? Why would an Ice Age be self-perpetuating? Albedo effect. What's albedo? The white reflecting the sun back to Very good, Harvey. Yes. And, and the albedo change is very significant. What happens is as the ice expands, ice is light colored, it's white, it's highly reflective, and it reflects a great deal of heat. And it reflects the heat, enough heat away, so that the area peripheral to the ice sheet stays extremely cold. Well, what that seems to imply is that an ice sheet should be perpetually growing uh, because it's cooling, constantly cooling the region where it's at. And in fact, there's evidence now during the Ordovician maybe that there were an, at least one episode where there was a runaway ice age where whatever feedback mechanisms have con constrained ice ages weren't working and the whole planet became frozen, even to the equator. Have you heard about that? Yeah even to the equator, the whole planet became frozen. And that would be, in a sense, that would be the logical outcome of an, of an ice age. But there are obviously other factors involved that restrain that process because we've been through perhaps 40 glacial and interglacial cycles since the Pleistocene began <laughs> two million years ago. And we don't still, there's no consensus or really comprehension of what triggers the onset of an ice age in the first place and then secondly once we're deep into the to the state of ice age what brings the earth out you know how do we go back say 26 to 30,000 years ago to a climate probably not much different than now and within a few thousand years the earth has completely shifted modes and now you've got a massive expansion of, of ice sheets around the planet to the extent that all of Canada is swallowed up in, in ice. All of the northern United States, all of northwestern Europe is swallowed up in ice. High mountain ranges all over the world, the Himalayas, the Andes, the Rockies, the Pyrenees, they're all swallowed up in ice. Sea levels begin to drop down, and they drop 400 feet worldwide. As they drop, they expose millions of miles of now new, newly uncovered land that had previously been shallow marine ecologies underwater, they're now exposed. The, the changes that are wrought upon the planet's surface are, are profound at the onset of an ice age. And probably since we humans have been here, 
we have experienced a minimum of four, possibly six or eight transitions into ice ages and out of ice ages. And the problem with, a, with catastrophism, one of the problems is, is that once you recognize the, the, the footprints of catastrophe, See, the problem is, is that when you have a great catastrophe, it so completely rearranges and changes what came before that it oftentimes erases the footprints of the earlier catastrophes. One gauge that we can use to try to determine the severity of a catastrophe is what effect does it have on life? What effect does it have on the biosphere? 12,000 years ago, there was a major effect on the biosphere. In fact, you could put it this way. It's, it's, it's not unrealistic to say that 12,000 years ago, the top of the food chain was decapitated for the most part. I mean, this happened. The top of the food chain, the global food chain, was essentially decapitated uh, simultaneous with this transition out of the ice. And what I mean by that is essentially the other, let's assume humans for the moment are the top of the food chain. Then what are we going to have underneath us? We're going to have the large predators. Then under the large predator, predators are going to be the large herbivores. And what we see is that um, globally, three quarters of the large predators and large herbivores disappeared at 12,000 years ago. And as far as paleontologists are able to tell, that disappearance of species was the most severe that this planet has suffered in perhaps as much as five million years definitely the most severe effects on the, on the, on the um, animal life of the planet in three million years. It just depends on how, there was two events, there was a three million year event, there was a five million year event. Which one of those turns out to be equal or to exceed the event of 12,000 years ago is, is yet to be determined because the, the, all, this, the count of species loss is not completed yet. But at least three million and probably five million years is how far you'd have to go back on planet Earth to find an effect as severe on, on at least on the large animal life of the planet as what happened 12,000 years ago. And as I've said repeatedly in here, the dominant theory as to what happened is what? Human predation. Human predation. And we're supposed to believe that human beings hunted to extinction 75 percent of all the large animals. And when we say large animals, we define those as any animal that's about 100 pounds in body weight or more. And this is something we've covered, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, although we certainly didn't cover it in the thoroughness that it warrants, because basically we're talking about getting to the bottom of the greatest catastrophe, not only to engulf this planet since we humans have been here, but of the greatest catastrophe of the last five million years. And I believe that this catastrophe holds the secret to a whole, holds the, the key to understanding a whole lot of things uh, in other distantly related fields of history and prehistory and human development and um, mythology and ancient architecture, occult traditions and so forth, that, that the recognition that there are these thresholds that get breached and once that threshold is breached for a short period of time, chaos reigns supreme and at the end of this episode things begin to settle out but at that point you have a new balance of nature, a new order of nature or as it says on the great seal, a new order of the ages commences in the wake of these catastrophes. And of course one reason why I believe that understanding the, the, the mechanics of these catastrophes is so important is that everything I have looked at in the last 25 years about the nature of, and pace of change suggests the same conclusion over and over and over again is that we have had and enjoyed an unprecedentedly long period without a major catastrophe. In fact, probably the longest period without a major catastrophe at least within the last million years. Certainly when we look at the, the reconstruction of climate that goes back over a quarter million years, 250,000 years, and which is the length of time that our ice cores reveal to us. The ice cores taken from Antarctica, the ice cores taken from Greenland, 
we, by means of these ice cores, we can reconstruct a fairly accurate climate proxy that can go back a quarter of a million years. Now, the, the significance of that 250,000 year period seems to be that as the age of modern humans is getting pushed back constantly all the time, five to ten years ago, the oldest modern human was dated at 120 to 150,000 years. In the last five to ten years, there have been several specimens of what appear to be completely modern humans that are over 180,000 years old. Now, if you have a modern human that's 180,000 years old, how much longer, how much previous to that 180,000 years were there modern humans? I'm going to guess that before we're through, we're going to push the age of modern humans on Earth back at least a quarter of a million years. If we do that, we're now essentially back, that's the age of the core of the Greenland ice cap. 250,000 years ago, something happened and ice began to accumulate on Greenland. So the, the, the two mile thick layer of ice that covers Greenland goes back when you core down through the middle of it, you're coring back 250,000 years. In that 250,000 years, since those ice cores were extracted in the early 1990s, the scientists, the glaciologists, the scientists that study pollen and spores, the, the scientists that study the gases that are entrapped in the ice, uh, the scientists that study the dust that's accumulated from, from volcanoes, from windstorms, from outer space, etc. All of these guys have been working on studying these ice cores for 15 years now. Okay. What are they coming up with? Well, one of the things that they've come up with that is of extreme relevance for, for modern human beings is that there has been no time within the last 250,000 years where we have gone over six or 8,000 years without a major climate change equivalent to the kind of climate change that drives the planet from an interglacial period into a glacial period and back again. We've been in one of those episodes for over 9,000 going on 10,000 years now. In other words, we've exceeded the record of stable climate by at least two or 3,000 years out of the last 250,000 years. When we look at the Holocene of the last 10,000 years, we take this, this, the scale of climate change, we compress it down to the 10,000 year period, and what we see that out of the last 10,000 years, is there has been no period of climate change um, of stable climate longer than the one we're enjoying right now. So in other words, within the 10,000 years of the Holocene, you have no period of stable climate more than three or 400 years long, where there hasn't been a major shift in climate of perhaps up to a degree and a half or two degrees centigrade. We have gone now for about that length of time without a major shift. In fact, we can go back to the major shift that, ha that essentially plummeted the world into the Dark Ages of 536 to 540 AD. This ties it back in with the Holy Grail stuff we were talking about for the last few weeks because one of the, the major components of the Holy Grail mythos has to do with this major shift that transforms this the, the, the uh, transform, we call it Logris or Logers, which was the ancient name for England, into the wasteland and involves the secret of how the, the, waste, the curse of the wasteland can be lifted and, you know, the land's brought back to life. That was the essential secret of the Holy Grail. And we find that the setting of the Holy Grail, by coincidence, turns out to be exactly within the five-year period that this major global climate change took place, between 536 and 540 A.D., which has historically, even before the climate change was recognized, 536 to 540 A.D. was recognized historically as being the onset of the Ice Age, I mean of the, of the Dark Age. It's only within the last decade or so that the climate scientists and the dendrochronologists have put two and two together and realized, well, you know what, the dark ages wasn't just a metaphor, it really did get dark. And they go back to the annals of the Irish monks and the annals of these various peoples and what are they talking about? They're saying that there would be months that would go by where they would not see the sun. Months that would go by. So we've always assumed that the dark ages was merely a metaphor 
but it turns out that it, there actually was a dark age and it precipitated a major global cooling and a collapse of societies around the world. Well, if we go back through the human record, what we find is over and over again the same story. Human societies seem to reach a certain level of development and they become, they become so oriented towards a specific set of conditions that when those environmental conditions change, society, if it can't adapt along with those changes, the society, just like the species, goes extinct. And in fact, this is now becoming the prevailing model in the study of the sociological history of the human species on Earth, is that we create these societies, the so societies become entrenched into a certain balance of nature, then something from outside causes the balance of nature to change, and if human societies can adapt, they go on, if not, they disappear. And now it seems like many of the major human civilizations have gone that fate. Is that what is going to befall us? That's where it comes back and why I think it's so goddamn important for us to come to terms with all of this stuff. Because modern science is completely confirming what ancient traditions have suggested all along in their stories of great floods and fires from space and apocalyptic disasters. This wasn't stuff that was made up and conjured out of some uh, illiterate, barbaric, uneducated mind. No, these are the tales of what our ancestors on this planet actually experienced and were able to survive, proven by the fact that we're here, and were transmitted down through the generations and through the centuries and through the ages to serve as a warning for those who would come later who would at some point be taking things for granted when um, things were actually ready to shift gears. My question is, is when is the next gear shifting going to take place? Is it going to happen in 2012? Some people believe it. I don't necessarily believe that that marks the date of any particular catastrophe. If, in fact, if somebody said, what are the, how would you place the odds? I'd say, well, the odds are 100% in the next millennium. And they're probably 50% for the next century. But what that means is that they could be 50% in the next century or they could be 50% in the next two or three years. See, that's the problem. I mean, we may have 50 years to prepare, but we may not. We may have 100. We may have several centuries to prepare, but we may not. Because we have already exceeded. The modern period of stable climate has already exceeded. By whatever measure, by whatever yardstick you choose to, to use, the modern period of stable climate has, has exceeded any known precedent, at least since during the time that we humans have been around. So is that something that political leaders should be talking about, you think? Is that something that should be more on the radar screen? Is that something that should be taught in school? Hey, you know this myth about the Great Flood, the story about Atlantis? Hey, it might be true. It might be possible to factually demonstrate the reality of these stories. Well, if that's the case, do we shrug our shoulders and go on, or do we say this is something that has to be factored into our zeitgeist, into our worldview, and, and affect our worldview from this point on? I, of course, would hope that it would be the latter, because I believe that once we become... Uh, more aware or more cognizant of our own impending mortality. You know, it's like um, what, what um, oh, uh, business philosophers used to write about in the 70s and 80s was the Titanic effect. And they say the more the business is prepared for a catastrophe, the better it's going to be able to not either to prevent that catastrophe or to weather that catastrophe once it happens. That was known as the Titanic effect. Well, I think we might need to come to a Titanic effect as far as the planetary consciousness is concerned and realize that we humans are actually all in the same boat and that is that we are totally vulnerable at this moment to forces from outside our system that could at any time shift gears and completely change the whole equation and we are constantly being given little flicks little nudges saying hey look what happens when even a micro event happens a hurricane is a micro event when we start talking about the kinds of things that changed, that brought the world out of the last ice age and caused this mass extinction. Compared to that, a hurricane, the most devastating hurricane in modern times, is a micro event, a mini event. Because it's very probable that there were hypercanes 
in that climatary transition out of the ice age. And you know what a hypercane is. A hypercane is a, is a, uh, a hurricane that may cover, that may have, uh, be over a thousand miles in diameter with winds up to 600 miles an hour. And these things have been modeled. And in fact, one, once the hypercanes were shown to be a very po real possibility, and triggered by the two, two group, uh, most likely triggers for a hypercane was one, a tremendous undersea volcanic eruption, and two, an asteroid or a comet impact into the ocean. You know, when an, when an object from space comes in, when, when our planet meets an object from space, that object is carrying unbelievable amounts of energy. And let me put it in perspective. In the early 1960s, Soviet Union, America, in this Cold War standoff, this nuclear standoff, right? We're testing nuclear weapons. The Soviets are testing nuclear weapons. We've gone from a little pop gun explosion, which was, took out the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 10 or 15 kilotons of, of highly purified chemical explosive, TNT, up to a, a, a megaton, meaning a million tons, up to several dozen megatons. The Soviets blew off a, in 1962, they tested a hydrogen bomb that's estimated to have been between 50 and 60 megatons. This is about double, about double the explosion that wiped out 2,000 square kilometers, 700 square miles of Siberia back in 1908, 100 years ago. At the peak of the Cold War, the U.S. and the Soviet nuclear arsenals total together were about 10,000 megatons. 10,000 megatons. Do you have any idea how much energy it would take to melt the entire ice cap of the last ice age? Let me tell you this, you couldn't do it with the entire nuclear arsenal of the Soviet Union and the United States at the, at the early 60s, at the peak of the Cold War. When our, our arsenal's total megatonnage, global megatonnage now is about half of that, about 5,000 megatons. And though, you know, India and Pakistan have probably have joined a nuclear club, Israel has, England has. But back in the early 1960s, it was the Soviet Union and, and the Americans, and together they had about 10,000 megatons, which was estimated to be able to wipe out the world completely 100 times over if it was distributed uniformly around the planet. Do you have any idea how much energy it would take to melt the ice complex? Well, I will tell you this. The entire nuclear arsenals of 10,000 megatons wouldn't even come close. It wouldn't even come close. In fact, one, one Missoula flood would be perhaps 100 times more energy release the entire, than the entire nuclear arsenal. Perhaps 100,000 megatons would be the range of one Missoula flood flow. One Missoula flood flow. Now we're talking about we have to multiply that by somewhere between 10 to the second and 10 to the third to try to explain how we get rid of all of this ice. It'd be like, how would we, if, if your challenge was get rid of the ice cap over the South Pole, how would you do it? Well, we could take our entire nuclear arsenal, unleash it at the South Pole, and it wouldn't do it. It would cause some pretty amazing weather. It would cause some pretty amazing melting events that would translate into whole, you know, many changes uh, in climate and ocean, but it wouldn't melt the ice cap. The ice cap would freeze right back and be right back where it was a couple of years later, even if we melted you know, several thousand cubic miles of ice with, that, with our nuclear arsenal, and that would be realistic. But bear in mind, there's 6 million cubic miles of ice there. And during the end of the last ice age, there was 10 million cubic miles of ice. And somewhere overnight, in a geological sense, all that ice disappeared. Boom, it was gone. And nobody's been able to explain where in the hell did the energy come from to do that. But we do know that at the same time that that happened, the top of the food chain was decapitated. We also know that the Paleolithic Age, what we call the Old Stone Age, came to a sudden end and there was a hiatus in the archaeological record to be replaced 3,000 years later by the Neolithic. Archaeologists have recognized that for 100 years, this hiatus between the Old Stone Age and the New Stone Age. And it turns out that that hiatus exactly brackets this 12,000 year ago event. And we don't know what happened. 
Nobody has a clue. Nobody has a clue, really, until within the last year or two. Then some major clues showed up. And what were those clues?